Kenbu. He is probably well known to all of you. Uh, he has been a Vice Chancellor of uh, CUT and since uh, 20.
in the late 90s, early 2000s, when I was a deputy vice chancellor that already then. Uh, he was head of the department of political science. Actually, I lost my job at UGW because of him. <laughs> I'm not going to tell the story. It's a long story. <laughs> uh, I, I also worked very well with uh, Max Price. We were in what people did. It's called the Senior Executive Team. He was Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences, I was, as I said, in the BBC and Vice Principal of this. I can count many, including um, uh, Professor O'Connor, even though we never worked at the same institution, but when he was Vice Chancellor at the University of the Western Cape, I was also a Vice Chancellor at, uh, at CUT. So we would work through what we called in Higher Education South Africa, which later on became Universities South Africa. So I should also request a round of applause for all of these four pairs of ours who have got to stay with us. My, my presentation emanates from many thoughts dating back more than 10 years ago. But you'll only see that towards the end of the presentation. But more recently, thoughts that arose from achieving the dream to the end for. But maybe before I give you some introduction, I must also acknowledge Actually, the young men who came here, Sinkiwe Umeni. I must particularly acknowledge him because he comes from Mutu. My umbilical cord lies buried in, in Mutu. And so I feel honored that uh, Imutu has a young person uh, like him that I could associate with. I must also acknowledge uh, the keynote yesterday, um, Susan, over there, because she reminded me that I'm a mathematician with that theorem, diversity theorem about diversity uh, increases accuracy. And of course, you can see from my topic talking about something for an answer. So even though this was not just motivated yesterday, obviously we may have been talking uh, over the last few months about making sure that the first two uh, keynotes have something to do with mathematics. An axiom is, is simply a self-evident statement. A self-evident statement is like if some things are equal to one thing, uh, then they are equal to each other two. Well, let me take this closer to our elections on the 29th of May. <laughs> an exit. So that was an exit. If two things are equal to one, they are equal to each other two. Or if I I count one, two, and I count one, two in that order, it's still the same. <laughs> okay, that's an answer. Unlike a theorem, a theorem requires some proof. An axiom is usually observed, it's not totally a thumbs up. It's something that gets observed and it's just like that. Kind of. So, coming closer to our elections, I thought, this is just an axiom. That if you voted for a political party that is going to wreck the economy of this country, you are going to be poor in a few years. 
<laughs> I think it's an answer. <laughs> and you've seen it happening from May 4, haven't you? <laughs> so, getting to uh, the sandwich answer of police, for or of police success. I came to this exam, and it's very related to the example that I gave you about what an exam is. Uh, as I said earlier, maybe it's 10 years ago, but more recently, since between the 19th and the 22nd of February, we were at achieving the dream. It made me think quite a lot what was discussed there. So, my introduction is really all about saying I've had those thoughts, the thoughts 10 years ago came out of my sabbatical when I was at uh, CUT. And I, I published a few papers then that were more about innovation and entrepreneurship. So, whatever we may have done, whether at CUT or DUT, when I was at CUT, around issues of innovation and entrepreneurship, uh, were really as a result of my sabbatical in 2014. And all the lessons I have learned across the world about how one must do his or her best with the young people we have in our universities to ensure that their full potential is realized. So, the question about Siagunalela is, and based on ATD 2024, is how far are we going towards achieving that goal? Are we going to be looking at only ourselves as universities in terms of what we can possibly do in our curriculum, in our co-curricula, in our extracurricular activities? Are we going to ignore the years of miseducation before the students arrive at our university? Actually, there's something very profound that I'm not sure whether I should still say Minister of the Day is Monday. I'm not sure. <laughs> Way back when he started off as a minister, I think around 2009-2010, we were complaining about the state of preparedness of our students, first year students. And he said something about he said, unfortunately, Vice Chancellors, you cannot possibly import young people from anywhere else in the world. <laughs> the young people that you have is only Thank you. <laughs> Very profound. So, will you ignore the miseducation? And a TD 2024 focus so much on what next? After completion, after you have done everything you need to do whilst your students are at the university, at your university, what next? We often see these days young people standing in the streets with buckets and graduates. Is that what we should be educating them to be? And I think that's how, for me, ideas around innovation and entrepreneurship started seeping into my opinion. So, having given that introduction and idea of what it is, I think you can already see the sandwich action. Mm -hmm. You can already see and the topics here says pre, in, post. 
university systems, pre, in university and post. Because what just this title says is that if Siapumelia's yeah. success is going to be determined on the basis of what we do internally or in the university, like in service for teachers, for example, then we are going to be turning out these young people into a lot of difficulties in the broader society. So, just like Minister Zimande said many years ago, those young people who are still in the pre-university phase are as much of our responsibility as those who are in and those who are our graduates post. But I should be stopping here, as I'm saying, but for the sake of what I prepared, <laughs> let me go for this. <laughs> I'm going to take you, having given you this introduction, I'm going to take you through um, what I learned from ATT 2024. Um, and then, what I learned, I will give a very brief analysis of what I learned. Which analysis actually leads you to pre in post as a, a little framework. And then I, I looked at some major theories of student success. And whether Having listened to presentations at ATD 2024 and analyzed those statements according to whether they are calling for something or for actions from us that are about pre-university education, in-university education, or post-university education. I'm going to then look at not, not, not many theories I'm, I'm really focusing on Chito, uh, Chito's theory of institutional departure. Because when I did just a test of search, uh, he is quite uh, prevalent in almost every article. And then I'm going to argue, and that is bullet one, two, three, four, I'm going to argue that there is a need for a psychosocial economic theory of success. Before I go into this, let me just remind you that I'm, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a sociologist, <laughs> you know, I'm a no, so uh, that's a disclaimer I'm making. Okay? And also, that what I'm talking about is in the level of an engine. It's what I think we all see, but some may not see it. Uh, so don't quibble with me uh, if you don't see it. Instead, I'm calling on you to do research on this exam, uh, or the statements that I'm going to make, even if I am misinterpreting Tito, because as I say, I'm, it's not my space, but you know, I've been in the higher education sector, I've been a vice chancellor, this is my 18th year as a vice chancellor. There's, there's so much I have forgotten about many things. Uh, in terms of who I am, other than being a manager, thinking about how can we make students succeed. Those are the kinds of things that have preoccupied uh, my mind lately uh, than others. So I'm no longer what I may have thought I am, and, and I, I don't know who I am. <laughs> Academic. <laughs> uh, and then I will end up with just giving a sense of what we are trying to do at DUT, dating back now to these ideas I referred to from my sabbatical in 2014, and how all of that links with the, uh, the sandwich item. These are the statements that were made, and I'm not going to read them, but I've just underlined some of the most important parts about shifting our work. 
This is what uh, the keynote address by Dr. Karen Stout led us to. But here she was quoting Natalia Christian, who is a 2022 dream scholar. It's about shifting from siloed interventions. It's about processes, structures, attitudes. It's about reinventing our universities. The second statement is also equally very strong. It's no longer about completion. That is our success metric. It's about moving to ensure that there is social and economic mobility of our graduates. So we can never be happy when they have placards that say, I'm a graduate, but I'm unemployed. Most agents, and I'm not going to dwell too much on, uh, on that. The first one, and I've underlined some of the important things, building boundaries, spanning partnerships that connect us more deeply with our communities. So we don't exist as universities for the sake of existing, for the sake of teaching and learning, research, innovation, and everything else. We have a role to play. We have to make contributions to the lives and livelihoods, as we say, at the end of our growing society. That's why we exist. We don't exist for our own sake. So I hope you've scanned over these statements that I'm not necessarily going to read. And earlier on, uh, the last statement there by Dr. Karen Stiles, earlier on I referred to it in a sense about ensuring that there is an equal opportunity for our young people to reach their full potential as citizens. Now, this is my little analysis of these statements. I've recategorized them, all of them together mean there is a role for us in pre-university education, because as Dr. Zimande said, we won't get any other type of matriculant than the ones that are produced by basic education, flawed as, as that system might be. So you see these vision and hope statements. I'm calling them vision and hope because actually the title of Dr. Stout's uh, keynote was about vision and hope for ATD. So I'm calling them vision and hope statements. So, by categorizing them this way, I was simply trying to buttress my thought about pre-university, in-university, post-university. That actually, ATD 2024 calls us to think along these lines. And that therefore, if there is any university that is only focusing on in-university arrangements around student access, then it still has a challenge, a big challenge, to complete the whole cycle. Remember that when young people come to our universities, they may already have been led to parts that they may never return to. So it may not matter how much you do to support them because some of them, instead of being led to the path of being engineers through maybe doing pure mathematics and so forth, they, have been, they may have been led in a different direction. So you think you are dealing with a young person who needs to be a sociologist, right? Maybe that young person actually could have been something else. So that's why pre-investing is very important. 
especially in our country where the kind of system we know could lead so many young people in different directions perhaps uh, even astray. So, what does the same theory then say? Because now I think you can see, hopefully, that this axiom of theory, that this axiom has to have these three components, three in post. Um, just think of these lines. I'm not calling them curves, it's but lines. Think of the green one as a pre-university line of success in university, pre-university. Uh, think of L there as sort of the point of success over time. Well, let me just remember for a moment <coughs> that uh, I'm a mathematician. The same is <laughs> true. In mathematics, when we have the line like that, we call it a curve function. So if two functions, f and h, and again I'm going back here, you see f is the green one, lower one, and h is the, is the one higher up. So it basically says, this sandwich theorem, it basically says that if two functions, f and h, approach the same limit L when X approaches a certain point. I'm trying to make this good enough for lay people. <laughs> and there is a third function G <laughs> between them. Between F and H there is a, a line, as you saw in the, in the previous slide. Uh, then the line or the function between the lower and the higher one is also squeezed to the same point if the other two are getting together. So, this is how the exam came about. And I'm really glad that you gave me this task of giving this keynote because I probably uh, would, would never have thought much uh, about the sandwich theory. It, it's a calculus. So I'm going to say, as an axiom now, if pre-university education and post-university lives and livelihoods approach a point of success, then in university, student success, which is sandwiched between them, will also approach that point of success. So that's the answer. Um, and as I said, an axiom is kind of self true without proof. Uh, uh, Susan, Susan's theorem needs proof. <laughs> <laughs> now, I then thought about theories, okay, uh, pre, in, post. If we have to be successful between these two curves, if these two curves lead to some success, we will also be successful. We need to. So, the, I, of course, not being an educationist, really, strictly speaking, I'm always reminded I'm not. It's important. Uh, <laughs> uh, I would not have delve much deeper into all sorts of theories, but I, I look at Tinto, which most people uh, might be familiar with. Tinto's theory, as you can see there, it says to persist, students need integration into academic performance, academic systems, social systems. So, if you actually look at Tinto, his inspiration <coughs> is from social systems. And that's why a lot of this we have been doing all along has to do with social integration. 
that DOT police students all of those things, all of those things. They are about social integration. Looking at it as a social system, and how how do you socialize our students at the state level, for example? But also, how do you socialize them? in terms of the culture that you find at the university that may be very alienated. So, Tito's theory is really about social integration. Now, uh, what I then did next was to, to look at this framework of pre-university, in-university, post-university, look at the at the, what I call, vision and hope statements by Dr. Karen Stout, and how Tinder's theory helps us uh, uh, in those. Um, I don't think, uh, as you can see, Tinder's theory is more based on e-university. Not so much about what is happening, what has happened with the young people before they have reached us. It just says when we receive them, we must make sure that there is this we, academic system, the social system that they find in the university that we could introduce them to, that we can support them on. So clearly, there is a lot more that needs to be done beyond Tito's theory, okay? And then I reflected a bit a number of questions about the vision and, and hope. How far have we realized this through CFML 1 and 2? What divergent thinking or disruptive thinking is emerging from amongst ourselves or will we emerge during this conference. That will take us further than where we are. That will help us realize those ATD vision and hope statements. So those are some of the critical questions I ask myself. And then thoughts. Amongst the CR Pumelela 2024 presentations, shall we find a lot of work that is focusing on pre university education? Shall we find a number of presentations or abstracts that are focusing on post university lives in Netherlands? I'm not mentioning in university education because probably 90% <laughs> of the presentations are there. But if we had heeded the poll, from ATD 2024, we should have started during this conference to talk about pre- and post-university success. So, in a sense, in conclusion, of course, before I touch on what we do with DET, uh, we need to be thinking of, I'm calling it a cycle social economic theory. I'm putting economic there because Post-university lives and livelihoods uh, are about many things, but more importantly, about the economic benefits that our graduates need to bring. And that's why they'll be standing on the streets <coughs> proclaiming to the graduates that are unemployed. So, clearly, challenges of student success are not only endogenous and psychosocial, as Tito would suggest, they are endogenous, they are social. So we will have to, if the papers during this conference are not focusing much on the other elements of, of the exam, or elements that take us into the social economic arena, then our work is coming. And therefore, see, Alpumelela 3.0, somehow, because it is only starting now, we've got to think very critically about how we could align it 
in such a way that we don't talk about holistic support in university, but we talk about holistic support pre-university and post-university. What can we do? We have the young people we have. We cannot import them from anywhere else. We have the young people we have. And we have a basic education system we may not be happy with, but that's what we have. We are being driven into all sorts of areas that are not part of our main job as universities. We cannot wait until we have sorted out our basic education system and we've got to do something. So as I close then, uh, and again, as I said, this comes, I don't know how many of these I have <laughs> Okay. Uh, 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 close to but yes, I'm about to finish. Um, at DOT, we have this one page um, strategy, which we call a strategy. It's a strategy map. And as you can see, it's organized as a balance scorecard. The balance scorecard was an invention of Robert Kaplan and David Norton way back in 1992. <coughs> the, the, the challenge we have, and that's another axiom I think, as universities, is that things start in the business world, whether it's about strategic planning, whether it's about quality assurance, hey, and we take years to catch up. <laughs> The efficacy of a balanced scorecard is that it also helps you with your performance management system. So with these four perspectives, running upwards from stewardship, systems, sustainability, and society, this strategy on a page as a balanced scorecard forces everyone at the university to think about each of these perspectives. So our strategy is no longer siloed into teaching and learning, research and innovation. Uh, for example, other systems, we are expecting everyone through the performance management system to tell us how they are thinking disruptively and divergently in terms of what they may be doing. And now let me not even use the example of a, of a lecture hall. If I'm in finance, What is it am I doing disruptively and diversity to contribute towards the success of the university? If I am a cleaner, can I provide some divergent ideas on flaws that may be cleaned much easier using less uh, uh, material? So I'm just trying to illustrate how we have come up with this strategy map that everyone could always go back to to find meaning in terms of their role at the university. So what, based on this, which of course I could take days talking about this strategy and page. But then when I look at Envision 2030 and the Sandwich Theorem, there is a few things that one needs to think about in terms of pre in post Stewardship and society really relates to the pre-university situation because it's about what we do internally and the manner in which as an engaged university we could do something, for example, in the feeder schools. I'm aware of, of the paper that will be delivered tomorrow. That is essentially about, maybe in Hashtag, that is essentially about a project designed for feeder schools so that we deal 
with STEM subjects before they come to the university. I know many universities have such, but rather than those being hard work, they must now begin to be integral parts of our strategies as universities. They must not only be the work of our community engagement offices, each and every academic, each and every member of staff, even in Tina, must be thinking about what contributions they could make. And again, tying that up with your performance management system. In university constructivism, we have changed from what universities of technology in particular used to be proud of. Universities of technology in this country used to say, we educate and train for the workplace. Where is the workplace? Where is the workplace for the graduates that are carrying us? Actually, who creates a workplace? This is what creates a workplace. We have hundreds of thousands of young people that are held captive at our universities who need a different type of an education. Not one that will educate and train them from the work workplace by the time they finish it doesn't exist. But one that will make them, as we say at DUT, adaptive graduates. A graduate who at graduation is able to go into the broader society with the acumen to initiate changes in that society, influence changes in that society, or respond to changes in the world that they find. So that if they have been trained as a doctor or a lawyer, those are very difficult uh, professions because it always seems that if you have to be struck off the role as a lawyer, you can't do anything else. Or a doctor, you can't do anything else. But through many theories of learning, which are basically constructivist theories, we now have a new approach. That our philosophy is simply our creativity and innovation shapes adaptive graduates who transform society. I'm using shapes, it's not a mistake. It's the delivery. But we go into an English lecture on that. Um, so, these are the ideas that we have come up with that, in my view, will help us in our pre university, in university, and post university uh, challenge. Yes, now we call DOT different. DOT does no longer stands for only Devon University of Technology. Also stands for different people who may not have been or may have been at DOT many years ago would, would know that it's different. Uh, we are now in the appended phase between 2024 and 2027. We're appending uh, so many things at DOT and we will fully transform. So DOT is now different, updated and transformed. Our tagline creative, distinctive, impactful. Thank you very much.
you too are a great part of Silicon Valley. And there's one thing that even way back then we see a point of one from zero. DOT started to around data analytics. And what that has formed within the entire university has been this data culture. We are not there, they see that all we need to do to a point that if you were to look very deeply into this Envision 2030 and you look at the plans behind it, first of all, it's a strategy that is more outcomes and impact uh, based. It's not about outputs and inputs. And as we all know, that's very, very difficult. It's a, a difficult space to get into because it's very easy for academics to say, we have produced so many things, therefore we are good. But to say, to what extent have those papers changed the lives and livelihoods of the broader society? We're talking now in the past. It's very difficult. But we've used power here, for example, to uh, design what we call a strategy check. So behind our strategy, there's a lot of data that we produce. And of course, thanks to the investors of the Free State, uh, Francois Straton, there's a lot we get from SASI uh, and other surveys that we also use for, for our strategy. So, if there is one thing I could point to that's been driven by Siaku Melela and also a few of our ideas, it's been that we've been able to crack to some extent the issue of how you measure outcomes and impact. Thank you. For the audience, please. Any questions? Any comments? Thank you, Francois.
they had centers focusing on innovation and entrepreneurship. That's part of the reason at DOT we have what we call Innovies, which is a center for entrepreneurship and innovation. It's meant to support our students for their post-university life. It's just as important, of course, it's a journey that we have to walk. There is still a lot we haven't done either as DOT. Uh, in fact, there are many universities here who have done better than we are doing through a number of centers like that. And where we are failing now is that. In fact, this reminds me of what I said in 2019 in what we call the DOT, the State of the Investor Address. The Vice Chancellor of DOT is a State of the Investor Address each year. To just give the community an idea of what we plan to do or what we did the previous year and how we are going forward into the current year um, and what priorities we I said in 2019, if DUT could each year produce only 0.015%, less than 1% of our graduates as, as entrepreneurs. Think of companies that could be coming up of the amount of students. At that time, my enrollment was 30,000, and I was talking about, about 15 students or so. Because the ideas for establishing companies need to be coming from people who have the knowledge and the skills like we impart as universities. So we should be setting up structures that can focus on that. But not only those structures, but we must now begin to change our approaches to curricula, almost like, as we say now, DUT. Our creativity and innovation shapes adapted graduates that transform society. That's now our mission. And if we don't move in that way, through the structures, through the processes, and so on, we will never get there. Thank you.
journey that you have set us on today is going to be a very long journey, with all of us having to play a different role from the roles which we probably currently play. We just introspect for a little bit and ask ourselves whether we're the kind of academics, the kind of people that Professor uh, Jim has, has just spoken about. So thank you for setting us on this journey, for reminding us of a bigger and a longer dream. And we have a small chunk of our appreciation for you for your insightful presentation.